Hello guys, myself Neha Gupta, your mentor for current affairs. Let's begin today's class. Guys, uh, I hope all of you are aware that we have launched the live courses for RBI, SEBI and NABAD. And for NABAD, we have already launched our crash course. So if you want to know more about the courses, then you can go to our application as well as you can go to our website. Okay. And if you have anything to discuss with us, that also you can do on the mobile number and also you can drop us a mail. There is discussions.anujinder.in channel as well where you can post your queries directly as well as we have the telegram channel where I have already provided you the PDF of this session. So quickly download the PDF because in this video guys, I have two to three news which are very lengthy in nature. At the same time, they have a lot of facts. So it may happen during the course of the video that you get lost in the middle of it. If you have the PDF beside you, then it will help you in gathering the facts more and more. So download it and come back into the session. Now I hope that you have downloaded the PDF. Therefore, I'm beginning with the first question. So the first question is what is the market size of the Indian bioeconomy in 2021 as per the India bioeconomy report 2022? So guys, here the right answer is $80 billion. Now what is this India bioeconomy report? First of all, this report is released by Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council, okay, which is short formed as BIRAC. So this organization has released this India Bioeconomy Report and do remember the name of the organization because if you do not remember it, you, get, you may get confused in the examination if a question on this is made up, okay, because usually such reports are released by Niti Ayu. But here we have BIRAC releasing it. Now under which ministry BIRAC is established? under which act or in which year was this institution established? These are two questions that I am giving you. So do it as your homework. Okay, so as per this report, India's bioeconomy is likely to touch $150 billion by 2025 and over $300 billion by 2030. So these are the two very important figures. Do remember $150 billion by 2025 and 300 by 2030. India's bioeconomy has reached $80 billion in 2021. And guys, this is an increment of 14.1% over 2022. Obviously, if you won't be able to remember this amount, then it is okay. But this is important, guys. This is about the latest one, okay, 2021. Then, if we consider this into account, $80 billion for an entire year, then it means that on a daily basis, the economy or the bioeconomy, what is bioeconomy? The economy or the money or the production, to be more precise, that we are doing in the field of bio, okay, biology, okay, be it your uh, biological products, be it directly or chemicals in the field of biology, be it your 45 uh, biological inventions in the field of agriculture, like your genetically modified seeds or any such invention that is done in the field of organic matter. Okay, so uh, the economy on a per day basis generated dollar 219 million worth of, uh, we can say value in 2021. Then on an average, <clears throat> at least three biotech startups were incorporated in 2021. And this is a very, uh, I would say, a good achievement for India. Now, a total of 1,128 biotech startups were established in 2021. So India is really a booming ground for startups. You all know that we are the third uh, largest ecosystem for the startups in the world after US and China. And this is a proof of that only okay in only the biotechnology we are seeing more than 1000 startups in one in a single year now the industry the biotech industry we are talking about crossed 1 billion dollars okay in 2021 in research and development so again research and development is one area where we need to strengthen the funding where we need to strengthen our penetration and again uh, we are doing so at least in the biotech segment now biotech startups 
are expected to reach 10,000 plus by 2025. Again, important number. Now guys, India is among the top three South Asian and top 12 uh, world destinations for biotechnology, okay, in the world. And we have 3% share in the global biotechnology industry. Now, this statement again is important. And guys, I have only picked up the facts that can be asked in your examination directly. So do remember, 3% is the global share of India. Then, India has the second highest number of US FDA approved manufacturing plants outside the US, okay. Then we have ethanol production of 3.3 billion liter capacity, uh, which has been doubled to 6.5 billion liters in 2021. Okay, so here it is also an example of biotechnology. We are using a product, uh, an organic product, and turning it into a fuel that can be mixed with another fuel, right? So Agriculture, guys, has a lot of protection for the biotech sector because in the agriculture, there is a lot of scope, like your genetically modified seeds is, are there. Then uh, how to increase the yields? How can we better grow our products, we, our crops in an organic manner? That is also a scope for the biotech sector. Okay, so agriculture opens up a lot of opportunities for the biotech startups as well as the industry. Now, BT cotton, Biopesticides, biostimulants, biofertilizers contributed to 10.48 billion dollar universe uh, billion dollar worth in 2021 to India. Okay, and India aims to become a 10 trillion economy by 2030. We all know, and in this aim, biotech sector can play a very big role. Okay, so that is all about this report. I hope that you have understood the report clearly. Okay, so the next question is, now guys, this question looks a bit like a phase two question, but we have seen this trend in RBI examination that has happened recently, that such type of question, questions in this manner are being asked in the phase one as well. You can expect such a question in your NABARD examination as well. So why not prepare according to that, okay? So the question is, about Padhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. I hope that all of you must have covered this scheme in the government schemes section because this is a very important scheme from your rural development point of view. So please cover it thoroughly if you haven't done so now. Okay. So the statements are Phase 3 of the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana was launched in 2019 for consolidation of 1,25,000 kilometers of road to connect the rural areas with Grameen agricultural markets, higher secondary schools and hospitals. Out of the 50,000 km target length, 47,559 km of roads have been completed under the phase 2 of the scheme. The data on expenditure incurred on the overall scheme is available at this portal. So which uh, statement or these statements are correct here? The right answer here is option A. Both these statements about the phases of this scheme are correct, whereas the portal is OMMS, where the details about the expenditure are provided. Now let's move into the details. Guys, I am assuming that you know the basics of the scheme, therefore I'm just discussing the update of it, okay? Basically, the basic idea of this scheme is to develop the rural roads and it was launched way back in 2000, okay? Now, keeping that base in our minds, let's discuss what is the recent update. So, in the phase one of the scheme, <clears throat> which was launched in 2000, all the eligible unconnected areas having 500 plus population and the Himalayan states and Himalayan Union territories and northeastern states which have a population of 250 plus, they will be connected, okay? So, proper roads will be laid down in the small areas, in the areas where the population is even 500 or above that if the state or if the place is not in the Himalayan region or in the northeast or in the Union territories, okay? Himalayan duties, right? So, 
and if the place is located in any of these areas then we will consider the population size of 250 plus okay so that was the objective of the phase one now remember that with the advancement of the phases the targets have also been changed okay i will discuss that but let's first know that under the phase one which is the longest uh, running phase so under the phase one approximately you can remember that 6 lakh kilometer worth of roads were uh, approved and out of them 6.45 lakh kilometers of roads were approved and out of them 6.17 lakh have been completed okay now in the phase 2 which was launched in 2013 okay the focus was to improve the road network again in the rural areas to boost the transportation to increase the transformation and uh, transportation and increase the economic productivity and activities in the rural area so under this phase 2 50000 kilometer uh, road length was set as the target and out of this 47559 kilometer of roads have been developed okay now even if you don't remember the current status you can remember the targets because it is in the absolute number in the first place and secondly the roads which have been developed the length of road you can remember that in all the phases it is very near to the target secondly if you can remember just the two digits of the length like 47,000 approximately roads have been completed out of the 50,000 then also it would suffice your preparation because in my opinion the examiner is not going to give you the very close knit options like 47 559 47 143 kilometers in my opinion that is a really far-fetched possibility so uh, remembering 47.5 kilometers uh, yeah 47,000 not 0.5 47,000 kilometers of roads that would suffice okay so that was the phase two now before phase three between phase two and phase three we had one more launch within the scheme that launches in 2016 so road connectivity project for less left wing extremism affected areas <clears throat> this is guys another component within the gram sadak yojana okay <clears throat> between the phase two and the phase three and you can clearly see the focus of this component that is to develop the road areas <coughs> in, in areas which are affected by the left wing extremism okay the maoist affected areas so here the target was set approximately 12,000 kilometers and half of it have been completed okay since uh, its inception till july 13 2022 okay now let's talk about phase three so in the phase three what was the focus what was the target the target was to consolidate this much of the road network with the hospitals with your gramin agriculture markets and schools so that development can can take place so out of <coughs> guys this is the total target so till july 13 2022 this much of road length has been approved and out of the total sanctioned road length 41,000 kilometers have been developed okay 41,000 approximately so that was the update on the phase three and all the three phases of the scheme now taking all the phases and verticals together the total road length approved under the scheme stands at approximately 7.9 lakh kilometer out of which 7.12 lakh kilometers have been developed now guys there would be a question in your mind that there are so many numbers do we need to remember even the road lengths so here my answer is guys understand this point that now the exam is getting tougher and tougher okay you are expected to sit in a competition which is at the level of cutting your throat so you can expect a question like this also in your examination because we have seen this trend the examiner tends to ask such questions which are really fact based and the facts are also very i would say lethal in nature like the road length okay so again i said to you all that you don't need to remember the exact numbers if you remember the approximate amount that would also 
help you in your examination. So, last but not the least, the platform. <coughs> so, we have the online management monitoring and accounting system, which is short formed as OMMAS. So this is the platform wherein the information regarding the scheme is provided, especially the expenditure incurred on any of the verticals under the scheme. Okay, so do remember the portal. Moving ahead, which state has launched the Swanirbhan Nari scheme to empower financially, uh, empower and financially support the weavers and their families. So here guys, Assam is the right answer. Now remember, it has Nari in its name, so don't uh, associate this theme solely with women, okay? The main focus is on weavers. Obviously, majority part of the weavers constitute women, is constituted of women, but still the weavers in the state will be getting the empowerment and financial support from the state, okay? Next question is, uh, which has become the first state in India to launch the vehicle location tracking device, emergency panic button system, and command control center of the state transport department for the uh, public? So here, Himachal Pradesh, guys, is the right answer. And Himachal Pradesh has become the first state to integrate the vehicle location de tracking device with the emergency panic button system and the command control center, so that if any kind of accident takes place, immediate action can be taken to protect the survivors, okay? So that is the basic idea. <clears throat> Who is the author of the Beyond the Misty Veil book? So here the right answer is Aradhana Jodi and she is an IAS, okay? And the book is basically talking about the temples of Uttarakhand. So do remember this fact as well. This is the book telling the tales of the temples. <clears throat> what is India's rank in the Henley Passport Index 2022? So here, 87 is India's rank. Now guys, 199 countries or we can say 199 passport were assessed in this index, okay? And according to the index, Japan is at the top. Japan's passport is the strongest in the world because it allows the visa-free entry into 193 countries okay visa free does not mean that you can go to another country and go uh, live there forever without any visa that does not that is not the meaning of it it means that you can get the visa on arrival okay <clears throat> singapore is the second largest 192 countries uh south korea's passport is the third strongest passport because it also allows visa free entry in 192 countries okay and this is guys the ranking given by the index. India's rank is 87. <coughs> Visa free entry is allowed in 57 countries. Okay. So uh, India is sharing this position with Mauritius and Tajikistan. Uh, and we all know that this index is a very old index and a frequent one. Okay. After every quarter, we see that this index comes up. So the basic idea of it is to assess the strength of the passport. <clears throat> the next question is what is the national average score of India in the India Innovation Index 2021? So again, this is a very important news. Do listen to me carefully. So <clears throat> the national average score of India is 14.56. Now this report is released by Niti Aayog and Institute for Competitiveness. These two organizations release this index every year. Okay. And this is the third edition of this index. Now, we all know that it is stating in the name itself, that is, it aims to assess the innovation, the efforts that the states and union territories are putting in so that innovative environment, the competitive environment can flourish in the state or the union territory. That is what this index assesses. So I hope that we are clear with this. Now, understand this thing that the indicators or the entire framework or structure of this index has been borrowed from the Global Innovation Index of World Intellectual Property Organization. And this is guys an annual index. <clears throat> now you can clearly see uh, the 
ranking of india and the score okay india's performance in the uh, global innovation index and you can see that over the years uh, we, our performance is declining in the global innovation index that is one point okay now let's see what our own index is saying okay this is the global index now let's see india's position in the uh, homegrown index in the indigenous index of ours okay so first of all it's a little bit tricky to understand it but let me try to explain to all of you the ranking framework okay so ranking is done on two uh, groupings okay first group is enablers second group is performance okay so in the enablers we have the five sub pillars okay these are the five sub pillars which are important for all of you to remember then the second one is performance and here we have two sub pillars knowledge output and knowledge diffusion now in the enablers if you see carefully human capital investment knowledge workers business environment safety and legal environment what are these these are the inputs these are the efforts from the state side okay only state can ensure to have an effective human capital state can ensure to have a safe and legal environment a business a thriving business environment so all of these enablers all of these sub pillars are telling us the efforts on the part of the state government or the ut government okay so these are the input pillars okay then the in the performance if you see knowledge output and knowledge diffusion how capable the man uh, manpower of a state is the skilled labor force of a state is that is assessed in the performance pillar so it gives us the picture of the output okay how effectively these inputs have permeated into the human capital that is assessed in this performance pillar okay i hope that this is now clear to all of you now understand this point that each of these sub pillars are further divided into indicators now let's move into the structure i hope that seven key pillars are clear to you human capital investment knowledge workers etc etc these seven key, uh, key pillars have 16 sub pillars and total 66 indicators which are further put into the sub pillars so here you don't need to go into the sub pillars or the indicators just remember the numbers one more thing that is most important here that the number of the indicators has increased from the last edition last in the last edition we had 36 indicators now we have 66 indicators which is a really huge increment almost the number has doubled okay so do remember now let's look at the scores so you can clearly see 14.56 is the average score of india in terms of innovation so clearly it is really poor right but still india aims to get into the top 25 of the global innovation index but how india will do that that is something to be seen in the uh, loop of time but as far as the present situation is concerned we are very low in terms of innovation uh, innovation score if we talk about the average score in the enabler category okay the efforts of the state then 19.5 is the score average score in the performance category 9.62 do remember these average scores okay so here you can clearly see the national averages have been given across the key pillars okay now here if you can remember all these pillars then it would be very helpful for you in your phase 2 okay in your phase 2 you can expect our question in depth like this and for your phase 1 just remember that safety and legal environment has the highest score and the lowest score is in the business environment and clearly we need to strengthen it because innovation is not useful if we don't have the job opportunities right so that clearly needs to get a push okay all the 30 36 states and uts were assessed and the states were categorized into three categories larger states northeastern and hilly states union territory and city states okay so let's see and one more thing that union territory and city states include goa because goa is a very small in area uh, state with smallest area 
so here you have the list of the states rankings first is karnataka okay and the last one is chhattisgarh and if you belong to any of these states do remember the score of your state as well as the rank because it can clearly be asked in your interview not in your phase 1 or phase 2 but in your interview okay so do remember and remember that it is a very flagship report so clearly they can very well ask you the question from this report even in your interview okay so here you have north east and hilly states topped by manipur first position and nagaland is at the lowest position union territory and city states chandigarh is at the first position ladakh is at the last position so that was guys india innovation index i hope that you have understood the index well and if you have any confusion in the rankings uh, categories in the state categories or anything you can ask me in the comment section or through the channels i have mentioned okay now the next question is how much fdi is allowed through automatic route in route in the research and development sector in india so a very interesting and important question 100% is the right answer so guys ministry of commerce and industry has released this data according to which india has attracted 343.64 million dollars worth of fdi inflows and these inflows were in r and d sector okay so again it is important because r and d is one sector where we are going to uh, we are making efforts to leverage that sector okay so fdi in r and d showed a 516% growth and this is the humongous percentage so i hope that we are clear with the two uh, facts one is the amount and second one is the growth now uh, this we have discussed that through the automatic route 100% investment is allowed in the r and d sector state wise if we talk about then karnataka got the highest fdi uh, remember we are talking about the fdi equity flows okay equity inflows so karnataka was the highest then we have telangana and haryana at the second and third position now top investors who invested in india okay we have talked about the total investments that we got but who invested so singapore stands at the first position in terms of the total fdi equity inflow uh, in the r and d sector okay out of the total 100% share singapore had 40% share this is a very huge share then germany 35% and us just 11% okay so uh, apart from this this is an additional fact that FDI inflows in the R&D have increased from these countries as well okay as compared to the previous year now top recipient companies now guys this is a very uh, i would say very important fact why because this has a high chance of skipping your mind that is why it is important and a question can be made out of it so which company is the highest receiver or the uh, top receiver it's dalmer Daimler Truck Innovation Center. Okay, it had thirty-five percent of the total FDI equity inflows. Then we have this company and this. Okay, just remember the top receiver. That would suffice. Okay, who has been appointed as the MD of ONGC Videsh Limited? So here we have Rajshree Gupta as the right answer. which company has received the raksha niryat uh, niryat ratna award in the private sector in india for the year 2020 to 2021 so this award was given for defense exports the right answer is indo mim okay it is a karnataka based company which has received this award for exporting uh, goods in 2020 to 2021 and bharat electronics limited has won the award in the public sector okay uh, among the public sector companies okay So guys that was all for today I hope that you have enjoyed the video and if you have then share it among your friends and if you have any queries you can ask me in the comment section or on the discussions forum thank you so much guys for watching this video